think we are running live here, so we probably don't want to waste a whole lot of time with small talk. Um, so for anybody who may end up watching this thing, let me, uh, first of all, <laughs> find my volume control and turn the sound down on my monitor back there. What you see is the uh, Blu-ray of the Criterion release, now out of print, quite sadly, of Jean-Luc Godard's 1965 masterpiece, <laughs> Pure Old Afou. And I'm joined tonight by Mark Herney, good friend Hello, that I've uh, had the chance to get to know over the last couple months. And if everything else works out right, uh, my local friend Patrick Goff may be joining us as well. Uh, he's answered the call for the invitation, but we are still uh, ironing out some of the technical snags here. So let's okay. just see uh, if Patrick's going to join us or not. I'm getting tweets on my phone here, but again, I don't want to get too bogged down as we uh, novices here on Google Plus uh, try to iron things out frantically at the last minute. But Mark, uh, thank you for joining me tonight, and uh, thank you again for viewers. On my right, you see behind me the semi-legendary uh, Criterion collection uh, that it, I put it together. Is legendary. <laughs> it, it is. It's gathered a little bit of a following on Instagram and Twitter and. Uh, my Facebook yeah. page, and just people who've gotten to know me here or there. Hey, I see the, those familiar opening credits on in the background of your monitor there too, Mark. <laughs> I, I had to put it on, you know, following, yeah. the, following your, your lead. I, I got to say, David, seeing the uh, the Criterion Collection back there, it reminds me, I, I feel like I'm taking a peek behind the curtain, so to speak. Ah, uh, uh, yes, where uh, the magic happens. <laughs> yeah, I'm, well, I'm, I, and I'd even compare it to, um, you know, the, the Bleak House segment on the uh, the Kronos Blu-ray where you go to the, the house of uh, Guillermo del Toro. So we sure. get a little, uh, little view here. So I, the, He's got me beat in the memorabilia department. I won't even begin to step into that ring. <laughs> right. But, but thank you. I appreciate you have that. The wall, so. it's, it's nice to be able to show it off uh, a little bit here. So so let's talk about Parole of Foo. Uh, you know, as, as most people viewing this will know, I've been doing this blog, the Criterion Reflection series, since uh, I actually started it in 2008. My uh, chronological order began in 2009. After I'd had the blog open for a few months, I kind of got the concept of what if I just kind of created an order or a system to go about reviewing these films? Because for the first uh, first several months of my blog, I was just picking up random Criterion DVDs at the time. I hadn't even got into Blu-ray back in 2008. Uh, and just writing about stuff uh, as it kind of hit me willy-nilly. But I thought, well, I really want to educate myself. And that's what started this whole series. But uh, even though I was kind of disappointed, actually, to discover I never actually did review Perot Le Fou back in 2008 uh, after I'd gotten that DVD uh, towards the end of the summer. I think it was pretty much within the first week or two after it had been released. Um, I never did review it, but I know that that movie made a very big impression upon me at the time. And actually, is one of it's one of the films, along with a few others, that got me thinking, I really want to take a very thorough, comprehensive approach to my uh, study, if you will, of the Criterion Collection. Hmm. Um, and it was just one of those films that hit me at that right place in life where... Uh, uh, even though I was quite new to Jean-Luc Godard, I probably had seen Breathless at some point, but I hadn't really locked into it. Uh, but uh, all the all the buzz that surrounded the re initial release of Perel Le Fou uh, certainly got me curious to know what was all this about. And uh, I could tell pretty early on that uh, Jean-Paul Belmondo and Anna Karina made a very attractive couple, and the whole kind of road trip and adventure and uh, it, even just the, the intimations of uh, spontaneous creativity and kind of mid-60s pop art and all of that, it says, yeah, this looks like a pretty attractive package. Let's just go ahead and do the old blind buy. And I've not been disappointed and really haven't looked back uh, mm -hmm. ever since. And and also just that whole notion, I guess, Pearl Le Fou, if you, we want to get into just beginning to summarize the story, uh, what's the movie actually about, um, <laughs> which is just, just sort of the platform that Godard uses to go into all sorts of different directions. Right. It, it's, it's, it's funny that you, you say yeah. that, David. One of the reviews that I uh, was, was reading is, is 
it says, you know, talking talking about Perot Le Fou, um, a lot of critics will say, will not say so much what it is or what it's about, but what it's not and what it's not about. So <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's one of those films that it's hard to to really qualify to. I mean, I, I can't imagine really trying to deconstruct the entire film. Uh, I'd love to see someone try, um, but uh, yeah, well, it's, it's it's been often written about. There's certainly a lot of verbiage online. Uh, I haven't found any real podcasts about it. I didn't do a exhaustive search, but uh, nothing really popped up in terms of other people talking about it the way that uh, Mark and I are. Uh, planning to tonight, uh, but you're right. The, the 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 basic framework of the film of of the narrative is is pretty skimpy and and even kind of conventional. Uh, a middle aged man and a kind of dull marriage, kind of a you know, uh, not even middle aged. He's kind of late twenties, early thirties, perhaps, right. or whatever Belmondo was at the time. He's he's a, certainly a young man in the in the fullness of life. Uh, he's got one daughter, but he's married into money. He's kind of taken the mainstream approach to just kind of, you know, the fast track to success, security, and middle class complacency. And, and one one evening, he just sort of has this awakening, if you will, that says, you know, this isn't really what the life I want to live. And uh, he runs off with uh, his babysitter, uh, who turns out to be a woman his own age. And that's kind of an interesting point in terms of the making of the film. Maybe we'll get to some of that. And mm -hmm. uh, it's a woman that he had had a previous relationship with. You kind of get that through the dialogue. And uh, he basically ditches all of the routines and conventions of his life, the structure, the, the conformity, and goes off on this impulsive, wild adventure with a beautiful woman, and they head off to kind of a tropical paradise, and he's going to live out all of his artistic whims. He's a, you know, he's <laughs> he's gotten into the business world, but he really wants to be a writer. He wants to express himself. He wants to, you know, kind of live the bohemian or unconventional way of life, and uh, and he does that. But then he finds out pretty quickly on that life is a lot more complicated. That the woman that he's fallen for has her own baggage, her own past, and that this little uh, escapade uh, is not destined to end well, and in the process, uh, you know, there, there's kind of a, a message, if you will, uh, although it's really not a message movie, it's just kind of a, a, an impulse in itself. Uh, Godard is is using this, uh, this device uh, to exercise some of his own demons and, and to uh, kind of kind of lay out there his own uh, commentary on the life that he's living and perhaps uh, relate to the life that many of his viewers are, are living or even contemplating. So that's my, my little nutshell stuff. Is anything you want to add to that, Mark? No, I mean, that's that really covers it. Um, I mean, there's certain themes that I really take away from, from the film. Um, one thing I would say is it probably has the longest description of genres that I've ever seen in a film. Um, I can't remember which site I, I had seen this from, but it's called a comedy, crime, drama, musical romance. So, yeah, you know, that's, that, that, in a nutshell, you know, that's what that's what Godard put forth for us. Yeah, that's, that that that's sums a, it up, and 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 he very effortlessly skips from genre to genre, even within the same scene or within the same right. take. You know, right, same uh, shot, the same. That's right. Mm-hmm. So, so you know, as as I thought about, you know, I, I got to this point in my chronology in my blog. I thought, well, I've got to do something a little bit different. And I've also been intrigued by this Google Hangout technology for a while. And so, uh, uh, you know, I thought maybe we'd get a few more people and maybe we, we will do this in other arenas and this is just kind of an opening venture here. But right. because the film has uh, impacted me in a more a personal way, I, I really want to delve into the uh, uh, the impressions and the emotions that it arouses. Uh, this is a film that many fans of Godard will consider their favorite or, mm. or at least one of the high points, but it's also a film that has a lot of detractors who feel like this is kind of where Godard kind of began to lose the plot, so starts, to speak. Starts to lose it, yeah. Yeah, and, and he his filmmaking style becomes very fragmented, uh, of course, in the next few movies he made in his career after this, the politics, uh, which are already beginning to surface here, uh, really dominate. And the the uh, 
what he might even consider the conceit of a an accessible narrative with the conventional protagonists and and villains and and all of that is just completely jettisoned. In in Perel Le Fou, we already begin to see this kind of detachment begin to surface. There, there's a story there. I've, we've already kind of summarized that. But right. in many of the scenes, the acting and the cinematography and the the framing and the setups, just they don't even make any pretense of trying to be convincing. Like, you know, this is not a, a simulation of a dramatic scenario which we would see right. in, yeah, the, in the, the more conventional movies. There is uh, is a you know, example of that where it's you can see that he he's not really trying to um, you know pull the pull the curtain from um, you know behind the the uh, you know the stage he's mm -hmm. y y you can tell you know looking at the scene that, that's that's behind you there oh they, that's what they're driving, driving in the car, car. right mm -hmm. yeah I mean you know it's on a sound stage you can see the lights are just you know rotating it's not uh, meant to look real and so right. you know he, he really he doesn't care um, that we know that it's a film I mean it's uh, we know that he knows that he knows that we know that it's a film you know that's, that's kind of <laughs> right. where, where I, I you know took it I mean there were there's five instances in this film where um, the actors actually will speak to the camera you know breaking yeah. the fourth wall multiple completely. times completely so. completely and and um, uninhibitedly and and really just like winking if not flaunting in our face that they're very conscious of the fact that we're just playing a part in a movie it, it's just it, it, there's a, there's a yeah, I don't want to say whimsy in a cute sense but it's really just kind of a nonchalance just kind of a right you know hey he, here's what we're doing and and it's probably fair to point out that Godard was was absolutely cranking out the product, if you will. He he was making like two full length yes. features a year, and right. and and not just you know maybe in the old uh, Elvis Presley movies of this same era where it's just kind of this real cookie cutter plot and just basically fill in the blanks, paint by numbers. But he's going in radical different directions. You know, the film right before this Alphaville was mm -hmm. kind of a, a bizarre film noir sci fi mashup in black and white. Uh, futuristic in in setting, but but also very low budget and kind of lo-fi in terms of not really trying to create this you know high tech scenario. They just used whatever they could to give the sense of of, of a future that was conceivable within the limited uh, resources at their disposal. Here right. he's going into widescreen, bright Eastman color. Uh, on location, traveling from Paris down to the Mediterranean, uh, kind of some echoes of, of the the big budget film he did with uh, uh, with Contempt with, with Brigitte Bardot and, sure. and 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 much more of a high profile, big budget production. Uh, so and there's also echoes to his breakthrough uh, Breathless, uh, which also started Jean Paul Belmondo and was also kind of a road caper movie, uh, Desperado on the Lamb, which we kind of get here, although. There's an inversion here. Yeah, uh, it's it's not the man who's the kind of wild renegade outlaw. It's really the woman, uh, Anna Karina. Right. And I guess in some ways she's a, a bit of a femme fatale. But you know, as I think about it, she really, at least at the beginning, didn't do anything to deserve the role of the femme fatale. She was honestly just there as a babysitter. You know, uh, uh, at the very beginning, maybe we can go back to some of those early scenes. Uh, uh, Fer Ferdinand is, is his name, and he's uh, he's invited to a cocktail party. His his wife is you know wants to usher him into some social circles that will help him advance in his career, and uh, he, you know he's the movie starts with him kind of famously sitting in his bathtub reading a uh, uh, some art criticism to to his daughter. Although we never learned the daughter's name, he just calls her, "Hey, little girl, come over here." And he reads her <laughs> quote. It's like, and so there's a, this this detachment you're already seeing. He's, you know, you know, calling his daughter little girl. I don't know if I'm reading more into it than that, but he seems like a, a little bit less than into being a dad. Uh, he's right. spoken in the bathtub at this point. At this right. point, yeah, he's he's beginning the checkout process already, and he goes to this cocktail right. party. So, <laughs> what are your impressions of this uh, this famous cocktail party sequence, Mark? Well, it, it it's I could watch it daily. I think um, <laughs> it's you know I, I I love the look of it. Um, I the colors of course stand out, and I I think they're I I 
I wish I could figure out what uh, Godard was really, you know, looking at for each color. And <clears throat> maybe you're not supposed to, uh, you're not meant to really truly figure that out. But right. <clears throat> Is there he symbolism with, here, or is it just kind of randomness? Yeah. That, that's just it. And, you know, one of the interesting things that, you know, we were talking about yesterday is the fact that, um, you know, between the two cuts, uh, there's the, in the Criterion version, these there's the Raoul Coutard um, version, you know, the one that... that the that, director uh, approved or cinematographer approved. Yes, approved, that's right. what I was looking for. Uh, so that was in, in the Criterion version, and of course the Studio Canal version uh, doesn't is not approved, and the difference is that uh, scene with Samuel Fuller in the Criterion version uh, has the green tint, and uh, in the Studio Canal version, it's just the, the color tint. Um, so, you know, I just think it has a different impact. So, you know, looking at those those colors, um, you know, it, it starts with the red, uh, which, you know, has the, the men talking about um, cars. You know, they're going Car back ads. and forth yeah. about cars. It's really like advertising script. It's it's almost like they're paid right. pitch men, right? Uh-huh. Mm. And the same thing with the women, because they're they're really pitching beauty products. So, you know, the men are talking cars, the women are talking beauty products. Um, and so then it moves into the the green, which is the the Samuel Fuller um, shot, you know, where he's talking. And of course, uh, Samuel Fuller can't speak French, so he's asking um, John Paul Belmondo uh, asks Fuller, you know, what is cinema? So we have the green scene, then we have the yellow scene, uh, very brief, where uh, Fernando walks by and uh, his wife is kissing another man, right, right, right in front of him. Uh, then it moves into a blue scene, um, which is a woman spraying with hairspray. Then we get into the white scene, which is our our first and then for the rest of the scene shot of nudity. Yeah, um, topless and, women. And it, and it's kind of exactly. are they just imagining these women? I mean, did they bring in strippers? I mean, what is this? Right. And there's no explanation to give it at all, of course. Right, right. It r- reminds me a little bit of the, the scene from Eyes Wide Shut by... Um, uh, by Stanley Kubrick, um, certainly yeah, I also, to that extent. But I also thought about the scene from The Master, where they're at that uh, party, and all yes. of a sudden, the, all the all the guests are are unclothed. <laughs> it's like that was right. a that was an interesting. I've only seen that movie once, but I definitely want to re- revisit that just to see. Is there a conscious echo of the Godard uh, pure? Yeah, party? I hadn't thought about that. I don't know, but yeah. it's just you know the clothes come off all of a sudden without explanation or and, warning, and, and you don't know whose viewpoint it is, which is you know the cool yeah. part about that shot. But yeah, so I mean, there's there's certainly that influence. Then we move into the into blue, which is a, a jump cut to green in the same shot. It's a very you know very subtle, a, kind of a subtle jump cut if you can have a subtle jump cut. But well, especially with the boldness of these colors. These are not tints for people who have right. seen the film. These are like really you know, drastic overlays. Like There's no missing the fact that there's an artificial color superimposed over the top of this shot. Exactly. Exactly, yeah. And then I, I noticed um, and then it moves into finally after the, you know, the, the blue shot, it moves into a brief color shot uh, of the you know with the where he's throwing the cake so it's yeah and uh, he's basically had his fill he's just nauseated by this whole bourgeois spectacle the the inane banal chatter and the the dull expectations and the you know you're not really getting a sense that he's got a, a political conscience here or or a sense that this is unjust it's just he he's really not cut out for this he's got better things to do. And he just doesn't want to see himself going down that road. So he he makes an outrage of himself. He he grabs handfuls of cake and plasters a woman standing immediately to his left. And 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 then you never see the scene of him actually leaving the party. But the guests are shrieking. It's obviously a big hubbub. And the next thing you know, he's walking back into the front door of his home, and there's uh, his babysitter, uh, uh, Marianne Renoir. And right. uh, and 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 there's a little kind of inner space between the, the cake throwing of, of fireworks, of, of explosions in the sky, of, of bright lights in the darkness. And so, uh, again, it's kind of like his, his epiphany. He's, he's like, I'm going for it. I'm going to make ah, the break. Okay. You know? Yeah, I, 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 I struggled with the fireworks, David. That was one yeah. of the things I was wondering what your take would be because they, they, they did intersperse fireworks, especially in the beginning. Yeah. In, in a few scenes, so I, I just sort of take it as a bit of a, a of an emotional eruption, if you will. A kind of, you know, uh, 
almost like, you know, I'm mad as hell, I can't take it anymore, or something of that sort. And sure. so, uh, and, and he goes back home, he sees Marianne Monroe, and there's an early scene where they're first kind of meeting each other in the hallway and keeping it on the DL that basically right. there's a, the flicker of recognition, but they're not going to say anything. And then uh, he just basically picks her up and says, let's go. He's going mm-hmm. he's gonna to make the bolt and out of the blue. And uh, he's well, first of all, yeah, he's going to drive her home. But then right. in that drive home, they get to talking about old times. And uh, he basically says, you know, this is a one-way trip. Let's do it. Right. Yeah. That, that's where I, that's what I took away from is he he hadn't made the decision until they were in the car. Um, yeah. You know that that scene with the you know, the lights going by and uh, mm-hmm. that's where he made the decision that it was that it was going to happen. And she she tells him that uh, she loves him and you know he reciprocates and yeah. You know, but and this is also where she gives him his name Perot. So she she right. already kind of intimates that Perot Le Fou. I mean it's kind of a Perot a clown kind of a a, 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 a name. And, and Perot Le Fou, uh, Amor Fou, uh, crazy love, impulsive, mad, reckless, you know, just indulgence in the emotions without heed to the consequences. And that's basically the right. title of the film, and that's basically the, the message is that, uh, you know, uh, y- you, can, you can follow that impulse to its own logical conclusion, which is probably not going to necessarily end well, but uh, there's a certain truth and vitality to that that uh, the artistic temperament will follow uh, right. whatever I however I forgot to mention out. yeah that it's uh, we're recording today on April Fool's Day so it's a, yeah <laughs> April it's Fool's appropriate. Day. exactly <laughs> and, and we did choose this evening for the occasion so right. so once they've they've made the decision uh, it's basically get out of Paris, get out of the big metropolis, and let's head down to where the sun is always shining and there's freedom and, you know, sun, you know sunlight and warmth and, and wide open possibilities. But uh, in order to get there, uh, they, they have a few steps they've got to get, get through first, which is first getting back to her apartment, mm-hmm. presumably spend a night together. We see her in the morning in her bathrobe, uh, it's a gorgeous Beautiful. shot. A gorgeous shot with a little kind of the blue tinting, uh, her her eyeshadow, and just the kind of the the, the calmness of that morning after. Uh, but then he recognizes that you know she's gotten herself into some uh, into some <laughs> entanglements uh, in the, in the right. years since they've gotten to know each other. She's uh, befriended some gun smugglers, and again, some of the politics come in with uh, her Algerian connections. There's there's intimations of violence, of money, of murder, assassinations, and all of that. And uh, sure enough, uh, uh, Ferdinand slash Perot finds himself having to really you know, step out of the comfort zone and get involved in, in some of the, the scheming and, and ultimately the acts of, of murder that, that Necessitate uh, are necessitated in order for them to make their escape, uh, but it's 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 a, it's just a kind of very fascinating sequence. I don't know if we're going to take the time to break it all down, but but basically they they pull off some capers. Again, the staging is is very artificial. It's it's uh, kind of hokey in a sense. Uh, uh, there's allusions to old Laurel and Hardy and slapstick right. and kind of you know even a Three Stooges move where they just kind of raise your arms, punch them in the stomach, knock them out. It's just, right. <laughs> it's right. Kinda, it's just goofy, you know. Yeah. Yeah, they actually named that scene Laurel, Laurel and Hardy. That mm-hmm. scene at the gas station where you know she she looks up and <laughs> he looks up and <laughs> she pushes him down. So and and this is where we really begin. I mean, there's the car driving scene that you already mentioned with the kind of color wheel spinning over the uh, windshield to kind of give the sense of motion, even though there's no other. You know, there's no other indication that this vehicle is actually moving. But yeah, so so the viewer, especially the first time viewer, is kind of say, "What is this? I mean, are we really supposed to expect that the gas station attendant got knocked out with one silly little half punch that doesn't even look convincing?" Right. Yeah, there, yeah, there's all this, there's this, this staging going on, but it's kind of, uh, you know, to, to what end? Uh, yeah, why, why I, I've always... our... mm-hmm. Sorry, go ahead, David. Well, I'm just. You know, why is Godard uh, not even trying to, you know, persuade us that this is a real action sequence, that this is a real car heist or a stick up at the gas station or whatever? Yeah, I, I always thought it. I always thought that uh, you know Godard's staging of action and violence and you know it, it seemed to be um, you know really I. I 
on purpose, I guess. I mean, I, I, I can't see that he was really trying to make it uh, realistic, but it, it's some of the, um, you know, most uh, goofy violence uh, in pretty much any movie that, that I've seen before. So it's it's funny how he, you know, stages that. Yeah, he's distancing the viewer from the sense of having to be engrossed in the plot. He's saying, maybe pay attention to other things. There's There's mm-hmm. ideas that I want to get across here. But it's not really based on the thrill of, wow, who's going to win this, you know, this this fist fight, you know, or are they right. really going to get away? Are they going to really elude the police? I mean, right. there's all sorts of, quote unquote, close calls in terms of, of uh, you know, who's going to prevail in this in this violent conflict, and that goes through into the second half of the film. But it's never a sense of genuine suspense. Uh, it's it's really more just kind of getting. The, the action from one set to the other. So there's a point at which they come across uh, after they've after they've uh, you know the Peugeot is kind of running low on gas. They've they've got to find a way to you know swap out the vehicle and they find they come across this kind of weird highway bridge. It's like built in the middle of this field, but it's almost like an overpass or an off ramp or something. <laughs> but it's just right. a portion of one. And there's already a car that's wrecked up there. And there's a couple of dead bodies of people who've been in car crashes. And it's almost like a preview of of the film Weekend that's exactly. coming up. Yes. And mm-hmm. also a rehash of the end of Contempt, if you will, where right. uh, the Brigitte Bardot character and her lover die in a car crash as well. So uh, it seems like Godard has a little car crash obsession going on here. Um, right, right. And, and they even the stage, you know, the, the car, the um, Fernando and um, Marianne stage their their own uh, car crash, you know, right. to make it look like they were part of that that car crash. So And and they also and and he also sabotages the money. She had a briefcase full of cash right. that would have been their ticket to freedom, independence and a new life. And and that also is is pretty strange. Uh, he he wants to apparently pursue some kind of artistically, aesthetically pure idea, which is untainted by the money, and also perhaps makes them a little bit less of a target if we want to start thinking logically. Well, if mm. he's got all this gangster money, and they're carrying it around, and they get caught, well, they're going to get killed immediately. But if they're apprehended without any money, well, you know, maybe they're a little bit more likely to get away. I don't know. I, maybe I'm overthinking it a bit. But but mm. so so they've basically been reduced to this very primeval condition, a truly uh, uh, kind of an Adam and Eve, if you will, uh, naked and unashamed, uh, although we never see them naked in the movie, but they're very much stripped down to their bare essence. And right. and then there's another car heist where uh, they, they rip off this prime 1962 Galaxy 500, a convertible, luxury car, sporty, just a pretty cool piece of machinery and uh, again another little very unconvincing heist that's uh, that's pulled off at a at a gas station they drive it off uh, they mm-hmm. ditch their old wardrobe they pick up the, the the luggage and the clothing of the tourists that were inside this vehicle and uh, right. so they've, they've kind of ditched their trail one more time uh, but then on an impulse uh, after Marianne has kind of taunted him a little bit about how he's just you know he's still kind of a square kind of still driving down the center lane and all that he says well let me show you this and he just <laughs> very radically just pulls off the road across the beach and plops that galaxy right into the middle of the Mediterranean there <laughs> and sinks it it's like and that's a pretty ballsy move I mean there's there's Godard himself uh, basically ruining a very nice vehicle and again he did not have a huge budget to work with and I'm sure right. somebody in accounting really had kind of a problem <laughs> with that but it's yeah. pretty yeah, I, I'd heard he had some help um, <laughs> he, had to, he had to look to um, Jean-Paul Belmondo to actually help with the uh, the funding of the film so. yeah and Belmondo definitely had the cash to spare he was he was a major marquee uh, attraction at those times and right. and, uh, and understandably so he's really the well he and Anna Karina are the, the charismatic heart of this whole thing. I think without those two cast in the role, and again in the in the, uh, in the booklet, you see a lot of other uh, names that were cast, Richard Burton among them, and, and right. some French pop stars, but as it turns out, I think they got the perfect pair, uh, even though the original story that this was based on was more about a, a middle-aged man, somebody maybe in his 40s, going right. off with, his, uh, you know, with a teenage woman who was babysitting his kid. 
changes it into much more of a Lolita type of tale. This is much more of a of a couple just kind of ditching conventionality for uh, the sake of anarchy and creativity. Uh, so there's a different dynamic at play here, but uh, Jean Paul and, and Anna are uh, adorable and amazing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we pick up, uh, and that's the point with the uh, with the Ford Galaxy, as you said, where they we get that first um, you know look at the camera. So Fernando. Yeah. Turns around and you know you, that first time when they they broke they break the fourth wall, which is you know again like you said for viewers who are not familiar with Godard has got to be jarring, uh, and it happens a few more times. And mm -hmm. you know he he looks at the camera and you know says all she thinks about is fun. Um, yeah. I, I love the scene and yeah. you know and she, he's like who are you talking to and he says the audience. <laughs> like, yeah, <of> course. <laughs> <laughs> and that and that is I mean and that to me I mean it's 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 interesting I mean. I don't know that that, that that didn't necessarily go over well, but to me it feels just like perfect from that era of the mid '60s to just yes. kind of yeah. that playfulness, that 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 uh, just kind of off the wall humor. And I mean, uh, I, there's another review I read, I think, in Film School Rejects that that referenced the Beatles' Help, which had actually come out just a little bit earlier that summer of '65. And there's definitely yeah. similarities between the Beatles. And, and help, and this movie of just terms of let's go on location, let's just kind of have some fun with it, let's make it up as we go. We won't exactly know what the scene will be when we get there, but you know the Beatles they went to Switzerland, they went to Bermuda, they went to different locations, and they were basically just kind of the young gods at play, just saying, hey, let's let's find a cool place to go. We'll set up the cameras, we'll you know do some antics and and have some fun with it. And I think there's a there's definitely a spirit of that playfulness here in uh, Pierrot Le Fou, even though there's also much darker themes and and heavier concepts going on in in Godard's mind, especially as he's scripting it in his kind of patented formula of kind of writing the lines that the actors will perform the night before. He gives them the script in the morning, they film it, and then it's on to the next thing. So you know, right. without a real clear game plan of where this is all going to wind up. He had some basic ideas. You know, they would go from Paris, they would go to the you know, the French Riviera, and then there would be some other, you know, culminating action. But how exactly it would resolve itself, he really didn't know until the story kind of told itself. Right. Yeah, you do kind of you, you do get that sense with this film. Um, you know, it you know, I, how many times have you seen it, David? The, oh, the, I've probably watched it probably eight or ten times. Wow. I don't know. I mean, yeah. it, but it's it's been spread out over the years. Um, I right. watched it probably three or four times when I first got it. I've kind of popped it in. I mean, when I got the Blu-ray a couple of years ago, or more than that, probably I, yeah, I watched it again just to kind of compare the versions just to relive the film. I've probably watched it three or four times in the past week and a half now. Yeah. You know? Right. Right. Yeah. It's 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 a film that you can you know watch multiple times you'll get something different out of it every time yeah. I mean you can focus on different aspects of the film um, you know the last time I watched it I really tried to take in everything and it's a, yeah. it's a bit overwhelming really to do that well um, he his his ideas are very rich I mean there there's just so much packed into each scene and that's one of the reasons I also wanted just to talk about the movie because blogging about it writing an essay if you will I would right. feel I mean just it's overwhelming. You're right. It's, it's just there's so much there. So like, so what do I want to pull out to write about versus something like this, what we're doing tonight, which is a little bit more freeform and spontaneous, uh, just drawing up memories, and I could probably talk about it again next week and have a whole <laughs> list of other things to talk about. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I had so many thoughts on it. I just know that it's one of those films that I'll, I'll want to, and, and really with any Godard, I've only seen... Um, I've seen a number of his films, but I've only seen three of them, or actually, well, four of them uh, more than once, and yeah. I can see myself revisiting these time and time again. Uh, one one of the things that really strikes me with him um, is the the his philosophy. Um, you know, oh, really, definitely, he's really a thinker. I mean, he really is. And that, and yeah, you know, we haven't really got into this, but but there's you know there's been you know there's this this theme of text of written word. Uh, filmed written word. I mean, the, the journal entries in, in Godard's own handwriting, and that's probably Godard's hand who's actually writing the, some of the mm -hmm. words down. Uh, in, in, this, in the context of the film, uh, of course, this is uh, Ferdinand's um, diary. Uh, as, once they reach the 
the, the, the shores of the Mediterranean. Once they've kind of gotten to their destination, he, uh, he, you know, he kind of lives out this uh, kind of vision of paradise. He's got a literally got a parrot on his shoulder, right? A woman at his side, the open writing, the sky, the blue sky. Yeah, it's, 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 it is. It's, it's definitely any, any creative spirit's dream just to have that freedom and like you know, no, no punching in, no going to work. Uh, and and an unlimited horizon uh, in front of him of just dredging up the essence of, of what he feels, what he sees, and 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 uh, he's going to write the great the great novel, or at least express his soul in, in this unique way. And so, yeah, in, in that sense, uh, does it get any better than this? It probably right. doesn't, <laughs> except that it doesn't really last very long. Yeah, and, right. and even the woman that he's brought along is not exactly uh, content with the situation. Right. Um, and and so there's that famous scene of Anna walking around. I don't know what to do. What right. am I supposed to do? Yeah, <laughs> and and I, I love just... how that scene is bookended with that. Yeah. You know, it starts with her saying that as it as it tracks her, and then the scene ends with her. You know, after they've talked about, um, you know, what they're what they're focused on, she goes back to that. You know, what am I to do? I don't know what yeah. to do. So. And and actually, that that scene I guess was based on some reality. Like they were down there, and and they were struggling to come up. Well, what's the next scene? And she was actually. <laughs> <laughs> saying those words like I don't know what to do like you know she's and, and, right. and let's maybe take a moment to get into the very complicated uh, history of uh, Jean-Luc Godard and Anna Karina as a real life couple sure uh, yeah, he, he kind of discovered her I mean you know she had already gotten some modeling work done but you know he brought her into into prominence as an actor uh, and uh, and fell for her he I mean he loved her quite deeply but I wonder and and again there's there's a lot of, and there's a actually a whole supplemental feature and the uh, Pearl Le Fou, uh DVD slash blu-ray that talks about the history of their marriage and that this really was I don't think it was the final time they ever worked together but it was really kind of the the terminal point of their relationship where Godard himself realized there's not going to be a reconciliation, and I think right. she is the one who kind of wanted to leave him. She, she decided for various reasons that he was not the soulmate that maybe he envisioned her as, and uh, and I'm sure that was very crushing for him because, you know, you know, uh, who can blame him? She's she's a beautiful woman, uh, intriguing, smart, uh, everything's right there, and I'm sure they had very good times together in the in the sweet years of their relationship and their romance, but. Uh, Things went sour, and uh, and at this point, she still recognizes that you know working with him is a good thing. You know, mm -hmm. he 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 made her famous, or he gave her the vehicle for her her fame and her celebrity to be established. Uh, so she wasn't going to stop working with him, but uh, the romance was definitely over, and so that's a very uh, kind of a subversive thread that runs through the movie, especially as yes. we get towards the end. But there's a very sweet scene, I guess one of my favorite scenes, one of, one of the most rhapsodic, where uh, Anna and Belmondo are kind of curled up on the beach, and her, her head is kind of resting on his his waist mm -hmm. there. And it's, just, it's really just, I don't know, my heart leaps when I see it, even though I know what scene is coming, it, because it's, it's right. just so beautiful. It's just so... Uh, innocent and pure and romantic. Yeah, they're they're um, almost in a fetal position. It know? is. It is. It's very fetal. It's very primal. Um, and very erotic. You know, very sexual. Obviously, where everything's positioned and all that. And then they have this little man in the moon exchange where they're looking at the moon, and it's just, again, you know, you know, he's, you know, Belmondo in character is just completely in love with Anna, and uh, you know, it it culminates in this moment of supreme bliss of, of just giving themselves to each other again nothing really depicted on screen but you could just feel the swelling of emotion and the desire to connect and to just you know <laughs> make the most of that moment if you will um, but that's really kind right. of the the emotional high point of the film after that everything really unravels and uh, and the the dream of paradise that uh, that at least Ferdinand thought he was achieving uh, quickly turns out to be somewhat of an illusion. Right. Yeah. It's. I'm glad you brought that scene up. I and I. I'm trying to remember. It may even be called. Uh, you know, like you said, the the high point called uh, perfect happiness. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's really to pick it that way. Yeah. They they have that discussion um, where 
you know, she really is. Um, I, I still can't figure out what the animal is. It's a big eared animal with a squirrel tail. Uh, I think it's but, a fox, <laughs> isn't it? On, on the picnic table there. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's a really <laughs> odd, strangely. It looks like a mix of a fox and a squirrel. But yeah. Uh, but at that point, you know, they're they're like you said, they, you know, they 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 have that tender moment, and they're they're sitting up speaking and talking about. Uh, afterwards, they're talking about, um, you know, they're saying you'll never leave me. Um, and he says, you know, no, of course. And it, again, at that point, Marianne looks into the camera, um, you know, so yeah. she's, she's looking at the audience again. So, um, I, she knows something is up that Fernand right. is kind of still missing. He's kind of lost in his delusions, if you will. Yeah. Right. Right. And, you know, it seems like, you know, she says, uh, and I, I've act, I think I've got it mixed up. It's uh, Fernando says, uh, you know, you'll never leave me. And Marianne looks, uh, says, no, of course. And then, um, she looks at the camera, you know, which kind of says, you know, yeah. is kind of gives us that sense maybe first of, you know, our, uh, what really are Marianne's, uh, intentions because, you know, she has this brother that they're looking for, right. uh, you know, supposedly, you know, so you start to kind of, uh, I, I think question, um, you know, her at, at that point. And that's, and that's exactly at the point where Godard begins to cast Marianne as more of a, a, a devious character, a betrayer, if you will. And right behind me is where she's looking at the... At the oh, that's the scene. Camera. It is. It's right there. Nice time. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden, this, this beautiful woman who's ready for adventure and uh, ready to live out these impulses turns out to be you know, uh, un, uh, untrustworthy complicated even perhaps a bit of a of a temptress or a uh, mm -hmm. a deceiver uh, because she's going to lead uh, Perot Ferdinand onto a path of ruin and and that's where some of Godard's uh, unprocessed anger comes through mm -hmm. as we get into I think what it, what it turns out to be the the dark second half of the film and that's where she her past begins to really intrude on their situation. There's a, there's a little bit of a scene, another little bit of an idyllic scene, where uh, well, there's a few of them. There's there's the uh, kind of the Vietnam reenactment skit uh, that they resort to to make money, uh, kind of right. exploiting American tourists right. again, uh, kind of getting into some of the uh, you know politically sensitive territory where Anna appears on screen with yellow face mm -hmm. and speaking this kind of a very uh, Ethnically insensitive Ching Chong type of uh, you know Asian dialect there, uh, mocking, crude, uh, but done so for the entertainment of the American tourists who are uh, portrayed as quite buffoonish as uh, real simpletons who have no real concept of the damage or the of the uh, the, uh, the complexity, the political sensitivities of of the the war that's going on. So again, right. Godard's outrage over what's happening in Vietnam in 1965. Now this is this is before the eruption of a widespread global anti-war movement which mm -hmm. really didn't kick in until like 60, late 66, 67. Um, and that's another thing about this movie. I mean it's just, it's just so far ahead of its time. It's really it feels very very contemporary uh, uh, really preceding the hippies, if you will, preceding many of the other sort right. of consciousness raising of the 60s, but very much presaging that. And so even though there's some perhaps problematic aspects to that scene, I, I, I give it a lot of credit for just the boldness and for the foresight to really, you know, confront the United States and its military actions in Vietnam at this fairly early stage of, of the war that was already escalating over there right yeah I, I do get I do get the sense in the film um, you know and again if it's good are speaking that uh, he, you don't get the sense he has uh, a great amount of respect for Americans um, you know and it, no. I, I don't know if it's you know I it seems like it's not just the <laughs> Vietnam War you know I, no. I think there's other other uh, you know kind of inklings there that yeah, he, he he likes his Hollywood movies he likes his classic genre stuff although I think he's probably recognizing that Hollywood's not making those kind of movies anymore either, you know, and so right. he's kind of having his digs at the ugly American. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about the, some of the song and dance numbers. That's another really delightful aspect of the yeah, movie. Yeah, it gets into my fate line. I, yeah, it's a yeah, great yeah. song. Go ahead, tell us about it, Mark. Uh, what do you think? 
so yeah, so, so we we move into uh, like you said the the play for the Americans. Uh, from that scene, we get into my fate line, and uh, you know we we get another look into the camera, David. Yeah. Uh, of, of Marianne, uh, she she's going dancing, um, you know, and she's you know kind kind of in that that mode of you know so what if they they catch up to us and she's you know you're you're getting that um, you know like you said the the tension has really started at that point she's really starting to assert what she wants and tells the audience what she wants where she wants a record player and he spends all of our money on books um, you know what, what money <laughs> yeah. you know so yeah, she, she has one little 45 record and he's like hey flings it off into the ocean right there. so she has her revenge too right uh-huh. right right she can't even you know and she you know, she can't even play the record because she doesn't have a she doesn't have a player. So, right. um, you know, and but but she she shows that she's more of a, a free spirit. I I think uh, in that she says you know she doesn't give a damn for books or money or records, which is interesting because she did seem to care about the money earlier when you know when it was burnt, like you said. But yeah, anyway, um, we'll 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 give her that. But so then the song. <laughs> um, you know, my, my fate line starts, and I, I just love the interplay between the two yeah. because it's, you know, she's talking about her, her fate line and, you know, where, where she's going, and she, you know, sensing that, you know, something may be uh, happening on she's the horizon. She's destined to live a long life. She, she recognizes it's kind of in the moment. It's, it's right. like, let's make the most of what we got because we don't know what tomorrow may bring. Right. And then, <laughs> but I, and, and I love how, you know, Fernando uh, really turns that with, what the man is focused on, the thigh line. So, you know, <laughs> exactly. Singing my Which, fate line, your thigh line, you know. They're both kind of in the moment, if you will, but uh, focused in different, slightly different directions. Right, right, right. right. So, and, and, and Belmondo, his, his performance also, although he's not a great singer, perhaps, and doesn't have the same lilt in his voice, but he's very athletic, very uh, physical. I mean, he's, he's jumping up on... on Fallen trees and just leaping right. around. It's 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 a very wonderful performance. Just just them romping in the sunshine, and I don't know if they did multiple takes or if this was just sort of a spontaneous exuberance. But it's it it's very delightful. I I, I love those moments definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It you know gets gets to that moment. Uh, you know another tender moment. You know like you said um, on the uh, on the beach. So yeah, it, it's one of the things I took away from it. You know talking about uh, Fernando um, a bit, um, or I, I just combined Belmondo with Ferdinand. Yeah. Uh, but Ferdinand, um, one of the th- one of the different you know something that really Godard takes away from. Um, this a little bit different maybe than a Hollywood Hollywood movie is, um, you know, I, I think Belmondo is not afraid to put himself in danger a little bit. You know, I, I think some of those scenes where, you know, like you said, where he's jumping around uh, the trees or especially the scene where, you know, the train is coming at him. And yeah, he's, that was you know, amazing. I mean, that, that really was serious business there. He's sitting right. at a train track. He's already had his big kind of break up with, with uh, Marianne, his first big breakup. And it's like he's just like, you know, this sucks. It's it ain't worth it. And he's literally sitting on the train tracks and you hear the sound of the train approaching mm-hmm. and then he gets up and just moments later that that real train, <laughs> no CGI folks, that real train is bearing down on him and it's like, boy, if his if his heel had stuck in the ties or right. he tripped over the rail, I <laughs> that would have been bad right. too. You know, uh, but yeah. Again, it's just it's just that 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 uh, confidence, if you will, that Belmondo. I mean, he was pretty much set, if you will, as an actor. He was a big star. He was getting big paychecks. Even if he didn't get paid a whole lot for this particular film, it was one of those kind of artistic uh, credibility and freedom things that he could do because he knew that there was a big paycheck waiting for him if he wanted to take on a more conventional romantic tough guy role uh, for some more mainstream type of movie so uh, right. props props to Jean-Paul for staying true to his roots and for giving his buddy uh, Godard uh, uh, a re- return favor since obviously his career was launched pretty amazingly with Breathless so we're, right. we're about 10 minutes left in our time slot here we probably need to start uh, not wrapping up with finality, but just kind of look, talking about the second half of the film, which mm-hmm. is, again, it's probably where the film probably drops a gear in my estimation. I mean, some of the some of the p- 
plot contrivances when the when the Marianne kind of reconnects with her old gang. I mean, there's there's certainly a loss in in my sense of of the magic, if you will, as uh, you know the you know the the uh, the gangsters get involved and there's just kind of all this double crossing and stuff like that. Uh, right. Some of the, some of the 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 daydream, some of the the, the euphoria of Perolafu kind of gets lost in the weeds as as we kind of again we we feel the sense at least to me it feels like you know the the wheels are coming off just a little bit here as we kind of lurch from one point to the other but but basically it turns out that Marianne has some loyalties to some of these uh, dirty dealers and uh, ends up betraying uh, uh, Ferdinand because he's not really able to kind of maintain her standards or keep her flush and once she gets back with some of her old flames it's like yeah she's she's ready to kind of ditch him and, and move on to some other things I don't are there right. any particular scenes in that last section before we get to the the final final part of the film uh, where Ferdinand kind of catches up with her we could talk about that a little separately but just in the I guess there's a little, the little bowling scene and just kind of yeah, uh, some of those little moments are they're kind of right fun. But I don't know anything that stands out to you, Mark. Yeah, I mean it, that's you know just what you said, David, because uh, you were talking about the um, you know getting where she comes back in contact with the gangsters, but yeah. there's still those moments of um, the levity of of a uh, fun, you know, like the bowling scene where um, and the, the you know, scissors the, there, right? <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah. Another, you know, there, there's so many if you moment Google, there, yeah. If you just Google Pearl the Food, there's a lot of uh, images that come up, you know, like that, like the the scissor right. scene, uh, right? There's, you know, and and the the scene on the beach, like you mentioned, but um, yeah, I mean, there's there's a few, there's a number of references in this film, and I, I again, I, I look forward to watching it a, a number of times. Some of those references come in late, um, you know, references to uh, older films, and I, I don't know if there's ones that you've picked up on, especially David, but. You know there are mentions of um, you know like Pepe uh, Lamoco, the sure. um, yeah film with uh, Jean Gabin, and yep. um, there's you know some Fa William William Faulkner references, um, or the, he actually speaks of um, Conrad, uh, Robert Stevenson, Jack James London. Joyce gets a mention at the, where uh, at the right. earlier on where. Uh, Ferdinand is kind of doing a, a Belmondo, I should say, is doing a Michel Simone impersonation. It is raspy old man voice like right. this, you know, and it's just and, and, and yeah, it's Looking just, the it's camera just again. exactly. But it's another one of these evidences of this kind of abundance of ideas, and and, and again, uh, love him or hate him, I mean, you got to give Godard credit for just pouring so much into his movies. He's right. he's just he's just this fountain of ideas and and notions and he doesn't sit back and overthink it. He says, "Okay, here's what I'm reading. Here's what I'm thinking. Here's what I'm feeling. Let's put it in the movie somehow." Get it in there, <laughs> and and, and uh, let the viewer make of it what they will. Does it does it cohere? Does right. one point lead logically to the next? Not at all. And <laughs> he doesn't really concern himself too much with that. He's just saying, you know, join me as far as you're willing to in this experience of, of where he's at in life. And I think, you know, again, I have not really watched a lot of later Godard, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I I expect that once I've sort of plowed my way through the Criterion entries uh, in his uh, first, maybe third or whatever of his career, I may try to track down some of his... Uh, you know, post uh, Tout Va Bien work, uh, which I think was the, the last Godard film to make the Criterion cut, at least to this point, and just right. kind of see where he goes from there, because uh, I've never failed to be utterly enchanted and, and fascinated by what that guy throws into his movies. And uh, and so maybe we could just kind of wrap up. We've got, what, five, six minutes left in our time slot here. So uh, let's just talk about the, the ending of the movie. It, it, it's it's dark. It's sad. It's it's kind of uh, pessimistic and defeatist, if you will. Um, it is. But, but when, uh, when uh, Ferdinand recognizes Marianne's kind of ultimate betrayal, that uh, she actually sort of sees him off as he's trying to pursue her and catch up with her and she's on a boat with another man and uh, they fly off you know, not fly but they, they 
boat off to an island uh, to kind of make their getaway. Uh, he tracks her down with this kind of obsessive killer's vengeance in mind, and uh, he guns her down. And another little very interesting side point, there's a lot of moments that are publicized. If you look at the still photos, you talked about the images, Mark, uh, the, the picture of, of uh, Ferdinand and Marianne kissing as they're sitting in two different vehicles. We see the image. There, yeah. There's a very famous image of that, of those two, but in the film itself, it's it's really a far shot. You don't really right. see them do that up close. Uh, mm -hmm. The shot and the poster of, of Ferdinand shooting the gun and Anna Karina with her arms outspread and falling fatally shot, you know, uh, she doesn't die instantly, but we don't see that actual pose in the film. We see it on the poster. And there's there's a few other moments mm. like that that are kind of uh, the, the the scene of, of Anna uh, or, or of, of, of uh, Ferdinand and Marianne climbing down the drain spout out of her apartment to make their getaway. We see them kind of getting off the drain spout onto the pavement, but we don't see that same picture that's on the, featured on the, right the here on the cover. Right. If you look at the cover here, this scene is never actually seen in the movie. And, and, and that's a weird disconnect, don't you think? It's like, it's right. publicity art, but it's not actually, uh, not even not even a still from the movie. It's not even replicated in the movie. It's just kind of implied. So it's just another right. level of, of artistic uh, license and, and creativity that, that Godard's tossing in there. But it ends in suicide. It ends in, 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 in sadness and tragedy. Path. Yeah, yeah, a glorious death with says. not one but but two uh, uh, clusters of dynamite wrapped around his head after he's painted himself right. blue. Right. If I had blue paint, I would be painting my face blue. <laughs> <laughs> we should have done that. Why I know. I thought I thought about it, but it's like I didn't have the right shade of blue. So <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll find some way to pinting the video, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would have been that that would have been brilliant. It's it, it's funny. I mean, I was uh, although viewers might worry the... about me if they saw me do that. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> No. Hey, no, no, stop! <laughs> you have too much to live for, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's just that the ending really goes quickly. I mean, and, and even, it is. You know that you, you like you said with the dynamite, and he, he drops the matches, and it. He's, it's all within like the last three or four minutes that this whole thing right. just kind of winds down, and he doesn't really right. milk it for the pathos. He doesn't make you feel like oh. How oh, tragic poor people, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's just like, let's get this damn movie over with. <laughs> That's about it, you know. There, I mean, there is that, you know, the the last shot, which um, I, I I'm still, you know, I still try to figure out what to yeah. really read into it. But you know, it he says um, it's the voice of Marianne, and that yeah. says uh, it's ours again. And he says, what is? And she says, eternity. It's that's just the sea gone with the sun. So yeah, you know, yeah. Kind of, you know, I to me it kind of brings it back that they maybe. I mean, I, I guess you could see it as a, you know, uh, maybe a, an allegory for them going to heaven. You know, maybe. They did yeah. Well, I, and I think but, you know, it's it's a quote from Artur Rimbaud, who is one of the you know, great kind of young, you know, live fast, die young poets of the French. Uh, uh, you know, early 20th century. There, uh, kind of these romantic souls who just kind of gave it all up for their art. You know, they they lived right. flamboyantly. They didn't hold anything back, and it cost them everything. But but oh, how precious, how how wonderful that they lived so fearlessly. Well, you know, as a guy who's going on as the uh, into his uh, fifth decade, or you know, well past his fifth decade, I guess at this point, um, right. you know, I I'm I'm okay staying alive <laughs> for longer than that. <laughs> Life is uh, good. But, you know, but uh, you know, I'll I'll read the book of those of those young uh, early flame outs and I'd say, well, there's probably some good stuff in that. But uh, if I had my druthers, I'd I'd stick around for a little bit longer. So you know, that's that's a boy, that's about an hour's take on Perot Le Fou. Mark, anything you want to say before we uh, shut this thing down? Um, just uh, you know, it, again, I guess overall, you know, I look forward to, to seeing a number of his uh, films again. Look forward to revisiting this. Hopefully, you know, eight or ten times, I'll get something yeah. new out of it um, yeah. every time. Um, so that's that's really it. Yeah, it's a great pop in and just kind of. I mean, you don't even you can even put it on background. You know, obviously, right. it's it's definitely worth the the close watch one, two, three, or four times. But even just revisiting favorite scenes or just taking some screen caps. That's why I'm, I am glad to have both the DVD and the Blu-ray. Uh, 
the DVD kind of gives me the chance to to make some nice screensavers, desktop wallpapers, whatever you will. Right, um, so many and, great images. Yeah. Exactly, and 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 you know, the the animate not animation, but the the still images, the cartoons, the right. the the pop art, <laughs> the advertisement, the you know. Art. All those things. I mean, it's 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 an abundant. It's it's almost encyclopedic. There's so much in there. So, you yeah. know, even we, even with an hour of chatter, we really have not even come close to exhausting it. But I think it's probably a good no. time to sort of say, here we go. There's our thoughts on Perel the Foo. Uh, I'll post this video onto my blog. Mark, thank you very much for taking an hour of your evening, and I look forward to doing this with you again. And I also look forward to maybe doing more of these uh, video sessions. I, I like the, the the freedom and the and the uh, unpredictability of talking about these great movies uh, without having to sit down and type out each word by hand. Right, right. It was absolutely perfect, perfect venue for it. Thank you, David, for having me. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Uh, definitely leave your comments and uh, let me know. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, here on my blog in the comment section. If you want to be participating in with uh, with me in one of these conversations, I got a lot more movies to get through, and I'm looking <laughs> forward to it. So, thanks again, everybody, and good night. Good night.